Welcome to Politics Done Right on KCFT. I am your host, Egberto Williams. This is the progressive program that will take the mystery out of politics. This is the program that will encourage you to make sure government becomes we the people. Whether you are liberal, conservative, or otherwise, you get to air your point of view. Give me a call at 713-526-5738. That is 713-526-KPFT. Remember, you can also send me a tweet to E-G-B-E-R-T-O-W-I-L-L-I-E-S. That is at Egberto Willie. Let us engage. It is politics done right. One, two, three, four. Welcome to one more edition of Politics Done Right. I'm Egberto Willis, your host. Today we're coming to you via great old podcast because I am currently away out of the studio going to my nephew's graduation in San Diego, California. Okay. Today we have a great subject, folks, or great subjects is what I should be saying. Today we discuss two issues, the state of our healthcare system and the state of the race. Yes, yes. I know I talk a lot about healthcare on politics done right, but why? Because it's that important. There are new listeners every day. People get sick every day. Today, many will face the pitfalls of our healthcare system, and in my humble opinion, we cannot speak enough about the sad state of our healthcare system. My special guest today is Tim Danahy of The Tim Danahy Show. Tim Danahy is also a director at Coffee Party USA. His strength is to take complex subjects, talk with experts, and make them comprehensible and entertaining for average listeners. We will discuss both topics in detail. But before I get into the meat of the show, I want to thank all of our donors to KPFT 90.1 FM and to Politics Done Right during our fund drive. I really appreciate what you've done. You see the reason why we must have independent media. So, most of our donation last week came at the end of the show. I want to thank the following most generous people. Ruben Gonzalez from South Houston, Texas. Doug Peters from Houston, Texas. Elaine Cahan from Houston, Texas. Salvador Perez from Spring, Texas. Anonymous from Spring, Texas. Evan McLaughlin from Houston, Texas. And I think I said that wrong. Evan McClanahan from Houston, Texas. Victor Trevino from Houston, Texas. And Johanna Marshall from New, a, a, a new member from Arcola, Texas, and some of those that I called as well are new members themselves. Now, we will discuss what happened in Nevada and how media manipulation can change reality that actually affects elections. But before I get to the program, I want to remind all our listeners that KPFT is a bastion of intelligent voices and programs. As a political activist, my favorites are The Monitor with Mark Bebawi on Mondays at 7 p.m. Think Wing Radio with Mike Honig on Mondays at 9 p.m. Partisan Gridlock with Jeff Berg on Fridays at 3 p.m. Jazz Latino, Afro-Cuban Latin Jazz at its best, hosted by my good friend Juan Flores on Mondays at 10 p.m. And do remember that before this show uh, at, at noon, Juan Flores is on HD3 with that good old Latin jazz as well. And there's a new show I'd like to advertise that comes on Thursdays at 7 p.m. on HD3, which is called Asamblea Popular de Houston. Check it out. Check out our full list at kpft.org, where you can find programming from music to politics to medicine, to the eclectic. KPFT is a listener-supported public community radio station, so please remember that if you like what you hear, visit kpft.org and ensure we remain strong, viable community radio station that provides news, programming, and information not influenced by the corporatocracy. 
This show today won't be a call-in show. I'm sorry that first show after our fun drive happens to be a tape show, but we will be back. We will be back to take your calls. I really miss all you listeners. We have to be engaged again, and we will be engaged again. But you know what time it is. It's time for the weekly blog post. I titled the blog of the week, My New Bad Healthcare Experience, There is a Better Way. Single payer is the only solution with other cost controls. Here it goes. I hate it every time I must see a doctor. The problem is that as we get older, we tend to frequent the healthcare system a bit more than when we were teenagers or young adults. A few months ago, I blogged about my high blood pressure scare. It spiked to 240 over 140. I was told I could have had a stroke. I didn't. Luckily, the good folks here at KPFT forced me into going to that emergency room. I was given two little pills that dropped the pressure. The doctor asked if I had a headache. I told him I had a slight one. He told me I needed to have a CAT scan. The CT scan was newer, was one of the newer smaller machines that did the job in less than five minutes. I spent less than two hours in the ER waiting for the pressure to fall. I was the only patient in that ER. The bill for the CT scan and the two pills was $5,000 that I must pay out of pocket. This means I am out of pocket more than $10,000 so far this year in healthcare costs, including insurance premiums. This is a direct transfer of wealth from the middle class to the stockholders of the private emergency room that took care of me in healthcare. There is little ability to shop around during an emergency. Even in non-emergency situations, recent studies suggest consumer shopping around does little to control costs. Look, fast forward to this week, my daughter is still trying my, my doctor is still trying to regulate my pressure. I'm seeing him on average every three weeks. Look, every visit costs about a hundred bucks. The doctor put me on a third medication. He told me instead of going to standard drugstores like Walgreens or CVS, I should go to Costco. Moreover, he told me to purchase uh, to purchase the the night of the, the night of day supply of each drug as if I had no insurance. The night of day supply of three drugs were, and and you won't believe this, the night of day supply of three drugs were much cheaper than the drugstore thirty day supply of two drugs with insurance. But here's the kicker. A lot of the people were not at the pharmacy, at, uh, or rather, a lot of people were not in Costco, so I asked the pharmacy, what would this look like if I had insurance? I presented my insurance card, and even the cash price for the 30-day supply for two drugs was more than the 90-day supply. Same. In effect, there were three prices for the same drug. The first is the price for the uninsured, the second is the price for the insured paying out of pocket, and the third, the price of billing to the insurance company. These are all schemes designed to sell drugs at the maximum price the market will bear. The problem is, healthcare does not work like an optimized market for the patient. It is efficient for the stockholder. Again, drugs and healthcare services are priced in a multi-tiered manner to bring the maximum profit the economy can provide. When a patient is in need of health care, shopping around is not only obscene, but diminishes the value of life to one's economic prowess. My experience is likely occurring hundreds of thousands of times, if not millions of times every day. Most people simply acquiesce to the system. They like feel, or, or they like to feel impotent. That is what our national psyche has devolved to. We believe we are the will of the plutocracy, or rather, we believe we are at the will of the plutocracy, even if many do not call it so. In our current reality, that is likely true. You see, we have been methodically conditioned to have a select few doing our thinking and directing our actions. It seems like Americans are starting to see the light, however. A recent Gallup poll points out that the majority of Americans now want a single-payer healthcare system. This is what it says. Presented with three separate scenarios for the future of the Affordable Care Act, 58% of U.S. adults favor the idea of replacing the law with federally funded healthcare system that provides insurance for 
all Americans. At the same time, Americans are split on the idea of maintaining the ACA as it is, with 48% in favor, 49% opposed. The slight majority, 51% favor repealing the act. What must we do to ensure that legislation matches the needs of the people? We must stop fearing revolutionary change that directly impacts the plutocracy. All candidates in primaries must be given a litmus test. Single payer, paid family leave, and all social services that make society reflect what the Constitution says. And what does the Constitution say? We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Look, folk, getting health care services should not be difficult at all. The hoops one must go through to get affordable coverage is still stressful. Obamacare was a start. It is now time to go all the way. Irrespective of which politician is elected, it is imperative that the grassroots assert their numerical power to have their will asserted. Today, I have the honor of speaking with Tim Danahy. Yes, that Tim Danahy of the Tim Danahy Show. You know that show that just about every liberal wants to get, every person that ever heard a book review as well wants to listen to. Yes, we got him on the show today. And not only do we have him on the show, we have him on the vlog as well. Tim Danahy is also a board member of Coffee Party USA, where he is an invaluable member in ensuring that we are actually going to change America. Tim, it's my honor to have you here. What's going on there in the good old Pennsylvania? Well, well, Egberto, it's a delight to be here. You're very kind, um, and uh, I, I appreciate the, the, the good words from you. And uh, the story in Pennsylvania, a beautiful day. You see it behind me. Yes. And, uh, uh, you know, it's just great to be talking with you, Egberto. As I said off air, uh, it's always a delight. Uh, you're one of the finest progressive uh, broadcasters in the country, and um, the conversations we have really spark my uh, interests. Absolutely. Well, look, today I, I want to talk about two specific topics. The first one is pretty much about health care. And, you know, for everybody who listens to the show all the time, they know that that is that's one of my passions, not because it is one of not, not for passion's sake, but because it is something that affects every single American. And most Americans sit back with their health care problems, their health care issues, the attention to how society deal with healthcare. Most people sit back and look at that from the point of view as they don't have a role to play in how to get themselves better healthcare. So what I want to talk to you about, Tim, is first of all, do you have any experiences with the healthcare system that you think could be better at, based on what you've heard, not only from myself and all the issues that we've encountered elsewhere, but your own issues, your family's issues, your friends' issues. Well, of course, we have to look for the health insurance, and that is as painful for me as it is for every other American. Uh, it, it, it's a, a crazy situation because, Egberto, like, when, when, when one evaluates what's going on with the healthcare system, we're paying at least 50% more than the rest of the world. We're paying about 18% of our, our GDP on health care as opposed to the rest of the world that pays about 12 percent and if you look at that Egberto that's coming in at about 600 billion dollars a year of, uh, that is costing us that the rest of the world doesn't have to pay on a per person basis so I, I think the math works out to be about two or three thousand dollars per family or, or per person actually per person. yes per person per year and our outcomes rank down in the low, uh, we're about a couple dozen from the top. Right. Netherlands and others being up there. And yet here we are with personal stories. I know, I know I have a doctor that lives next door that can tell me his travails. I have other people that are saying, my parents are dealing with 
with numerous doctors trying to keep healthcare going. And it's a struggle for everybody, and it's a needless situation. I think there's far better ways to do it. Yes, what's interesting, Tim, is that most people know that there is a problem. Most people feel it. As I said before, most people don't know that they can do something about it. I want, as, as I mentioned in the blog of the week that I, that I just read, uh, it was astounding to me that my doctor looked and said, Egberto, go ahead and go to Costco to get your drugs. Tell them you don't have insurance and see what happens. And like I mentioned in, in, in the piece as well, um, what happened was when I told them I had very little, uh, no insurance, the price of my pills were low. Uh, they allowed me to purchase a 90-day supply, and that was fine, but it was still monies out of my pocket above and beyond. Now, what was interesting is because Costco was empty, I, I told the person, hey, what about if I had insurance? And then I made her take a look at my insurance card, and she looked at my insurance card and said, oh, you have insurance. Yes, ma'am, but the doctor told me to do X, Y, Z. She looked it up. It turned out my insurance company restricted my restricted my purchase of drugs to only a 30-day supply, and that 30-day supply of two drugs as opposed to the three that I that I that I bought as I as if I had no insurance was costlier than the 90-day supply. Two day two pills for a 30-day supply was more expensive than a 90-day supply, none insured for three prescriptions. I mean, this tells me that there is no correlation between drug pricing and healthcare. It is simply a business proposition, and it is something that we have to get away from. And the reason I, I, I retell this story, Tim, is that I want the listeners to understand one thing. This isn't only happening to you. This, is, If it happens to me, somebody that like yourself, we work out, we try to take care of ourselves, but you know, we don't have control over what happens to us. If it can happen to any one of us, it likely is happening to millions of Americans and millions of Americans that don't think they have something to offer or that they have a solution to provide. What we are here for, Tim, the reasons we do what we do is we try to tell Americans, you can be empowered working together with different organizations. And later on in the blog, I will play some of the organizations that people should be working with to mitigate these issues. Absolutely. I mean, you take a look at uh, uh, hepatitis C, which will be a growing issue in America. Uh, we, we've had uh, doctors tell our family saying that this is one of the key issues. As we age, a lot of people's symptoms for hepatitis C will be manifesting. And and in America, it costs ten thousand dollars for the hepatitis C drug program, right. but in India, it's six hundred dollars. You know what sense is this? You know, it, aspirin. You and I could buy aspirin for a tenth of a cent, but our military has to pay a dollar a tablet because the government has forfeited its uh, negotiating ability with the drug companies. You take a look at uh, um, the, the the Medicare program that Bush passed, and it says, I think the number came in around $63 trillion unfunded liability, right. which benefits the drug companies. And, um, you know, my wife is in the healthcare industry, and, and Egberto, on your blog, are we allowed to use a bad word? Uh, yes, we are. Because no, I want to quote, I, I yes. quote this accurately. Go ahead. Well, because uh, a, a case manager from the hospital at which my wife used to work went to a cocktail party with a bunch of pharmaceutical representatives and officers and so forth, and the, the case manager brought up the issue that you're bringing up, Egberto, mm -hmm. and the case manager brought up the issue and said, what about the poor people that can't afford the drugs? And I will quote what the drug executive said, and it has an expletive in it, okay? Okay. Um, but she asked, what about the poor people? And the drug executive said, fuck them. That's a quote. And, that's, and I hate to use that word, it's... but I wanted to be accurate with the quote to you. And if this is the prevailing attitude about the healthcare systems in the United States, obviously something has to happen with this. Absolutely. Tim, I want folks to realize this, first of all. I mean, many times when we discuss healthcare, 
the average American is scared. Uh, they're, they're given scary information to be. I'm glad that you said that, first of all. And by the way, this show will be on air as well as on the blog. The on air version will bleep, will have the first time I've ever bleeped my good friend. Tim here. <laughs> I deserve it, you know, and I understand it, you know, but, you know, I, hopefully necessary. people can read, they can read my lips or the, the, you know, it'll be able to fit because if, if it was anything else that that person said, I would have quoted that. Absolutely. But and, you and need to know what their prevailing attitude is. And that is so important. What happens, Tim, is there are many times that once we start to talk about issues like single payer system, universal health care for all, Medicare for all, what happens with a lot of people is they, 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 the drug industry, the right wing uh, industrial complex, and now what I call the democratic industrial complex. And by democratic, I'm not talking about the huge democratic party. I'm talking about the establishment democratic party. They don't, they scare you into believing that somehow wanting universal health care that is working all over the world, somehow that cannot be done here in the United States. And you see different articles come out. There was one a couple of weeks ago that came out that said the reason why single payer in America would be too expensive is that doctors make too much. Oh, really? No. What? Exactly. And no. what they forget to tell you as well is that one of the reasons doctors have to be highly paid as well is look at the cost that they incur for going to uni universities. One of the things that they don't accept as a package deal. When we have a, con when we have a candidate that says, uh, we want to have free college education, when that person says we want to have Medicare for all, What's not understood is the correlation between those two things. One is if you have free education, which it's, it's not really free, right? Because it's paid forward. In other words, if I get a free college education, I get a job that pays more. I pay more in taxes. In effect, I pay back that bill for it's an investment. For, it's an investment. Exactly, Tim. And so I think what is important for folks to also realize then is those two are correlated. In other words, if we have free education, doctors no longer have to have an extra $1,500 a month to pay back their loans. So uh, therefore, doctors won't have to make as much as they make anymore. Your thoughts? Well, well it, 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 doctors, of course, make above average income, but it's not what people perceive. Exactly. I have a doctor that lives next door. And he says it, it costs him $30,000 a month just to open the doors of a private practice. Exactly. And, and, and his gross is not much more than that net, especially with the insurance companies pressuring him right. in order to comply with what their compensation rates are. And there's something about doctors, too. You know, we always talk about efficiency and productivity in America, but doctors are spending about 40% of their time now on insurance compliance exactly. and, and, and doing what they did with you, Egberto, saying, well, here's how you can try and get around it. Everybody's trying to gain the system because right. we all know it's wrong. And so, you know, there, there's many things that we can do. And we talk about specific candidates, you know, and I, I felt bad. And, and the one candidate who is the most aggressive on the single payer system was asked during the debate, how are you going to pay for it? Right. And you knew he wanted to say, increase taxes. Right. And that would be at the political death knell of his campaign. Right. The truth of the matter, he probably should have said, well, with single payer, single payer system, you can go ahead and pay your insurance company, but it'll be a lot less. Exactly. And, and that would have made it somehow palatable to a, to an American public that perhaps is not comfortable with that concept. What, what I would have wished, and you know, that is so that is so true. What I would have wished that uh, that he had said as well is he would have said, no, I'm not increasing your taxes, but you're not going to be paying, paying your premiums to an insurance company that is paying executives. You'll be paying your premium to a nonprofit organization who will put all of that back out. In other words, there is a way to create single payer without calling it a tax. I mean, right now, health insurance is a tax, right? You have to have it. So therefore, if you want to say it's a tax, it's a tax. So therefore, why not say, okay, there will be one payer an independent entity, a nonprofit that goes ahead and collects all 
ex entirely all the premiums from all Americans, and that premium would be indexed. Hey, Bert, uh, I, I hate this. Whenever I say, you're right, I like your way better. <laughs> no, no, no. But what, what I'm saying is, no, it, it, it's, not no, that, no. It's, it's not it's not it's not like it's my idea. I mean, no, I'm not you're... presumptuous to believe that, oh, this is my idea. That is, I've heard all these ideas bounced off as we dis I mean, we've discussed all of this and many have discussed these issues. So the body, the, the body of knowledge out there, Tim, knows what has to be done knows what needs to be done. The fight is between those who are fighting what has to be done. And, you know, one of the things I always say about listening to programs like yours and mine is we don't want to be like those other programs that simply complain and simply talk about what is wrong. We also want to talk about how can we bring solutions to the table? How can we have our listeners do something to move it forward? So you say what? Yeah, well, Egberto, I mean, let's just take two things. One, obviously, is Citizens United and campaign financing, and we could beat that horse some more. Right. And I'm happy to do it if that's the direction you want to go. But there's another thing, too. The United States and New Zealand are the only two companies on, or only two countries on this planet that allow pharmaceutical companies to advertise prescribed products. Yes. And, and so as a result of opening that door to allow pharmaceutical advertising revenues, do you think the big six uh, media companies are going to shut the door and say, no, 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 we don't want your revenues? The pharmaceutical companies have indirectly taken the discussion and they are controlling it by not allowing this kind of dialogue that you and I are having to occur. So if you want the, a second step that's real easy is restore the laws that were in place before where you could not describe, uh, prescribe, or uh, uh, you could not advertise prescription medicine. That would be an easy fix. And that would take the, the, the pharmaceutical companies out of the media equation. Now, you said you live next to the, doc, uh, to the doctor. I would be curious to know what is his stance on universal health care because the scare tactics are not only used by uh, on, on the average American citizen, but it's used on doctors as well. My sister is a doctor and she's a staunch supporter of universal health care, single payer health care, because she works with the indigent. She works with people who really need health care, who are not trying to freeload, just want to be able to afford having health care. I'd be curious how the doctors that you've been around, how do many of them feel? Uh, many of them feel many. Every doctor is an entrepreneur, right? You know, and, and so of course they would like the opportunity to work harder and and make more that correlates with it. But universally, every single one of them knows that the system is seriously flawed. You know, th that's a universal. Right. How we, how we fix it? There, there's room for discussion there. But um, single payer, I, I think many of the doctors, um, even, the, even the one who lives next door, has no fear of that. Uh, but but we, we've got to do something, Egberto. The situation is, is beyond uh, manageable at this stage. Absolutely. Well, we have to take a break here for Shannon to give us our weather report and for Shannon to let us know what the temperature is going to be like and the rest of the weather for the rest of the day and the rest of the week. Shannon, it's all yours. Welcome back. I am back with Tim Danahy. Yes, that Tim Danahy of the Danahy Show. We've been having a great chat on healthcare. You know, that's my passion. That is also one of Tim's many passions. Now, um, Tim, like I, I mentioned before, uh, while we spoke before that, I love the idea about talking about these problems that are that, that we have with health care, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. However, in empowering people, whenever they're done listening to your show, one of the things I always want is for them to feel empowered for them to feel that they got something out of spending the time with us, that they are going to be able to say, even if I don't do anything in the next day or in the next week, to know that I can do something going forward. So what I'm going to ask you, Tim, I have a few ideas. I want to ask you to tell our audience, before we get to the other subject, what can 
they do, whether it's tomorrow, whether it's next week, whether it's next month, whether it's next year, what can they do to move us forward? I know it's not going to be quick, but what can they do? Uh, a, a couple a couple things that I might suggest off the top of my head. Uh, first, don't be intimidated by the subject. You know, don't be intimidated. It breaks down into simple right and wrong, justice or injustice. Um, don't be intimidated by this subject or any subject. Two, don't be afraid. You know, there's no one going to beat you up. There will be people that criticize you, but you're on a good high ground. Third, what I would say is, you know, you write your congressman, write your senator, and you don't have to come up with the greatest letter with facts and so forth. Just say, I'm perceiving a problem. I think we need to look for solutions. I'm going to start watching you and how you propose to solve this issue. And the fourth is, is, is the easiest one of all. Just make sure you're registered to vote and go vote whatever it may be. But, but yeah, um, get rid of the intimidation, get rid of the fear. Just let your congressman know something's wrong and you're watching him and vote. I, 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 that would be the entry level. You know, that, those four topics, and you know what, Tim? I think that, that says it all, right? If, those four, if you're not intimidated, then uh, you don't have a fear to, to research, you don't have a fear of learning. If, you, if you're not fearful at all, it means that you can go against the grain. If you can go against the grain, you can come up with options. I love those, those, those four topics right in your congressman. You know, there's something that's interesting in this election. I don't know if you've noticed. And that is, in as much as we want big money out of politics, I am starting to wonder if big money has started outliving its usefulness for one specific reason. Uh, some people have not spent a lot of money during this election and have garnered a whole lot of support. So um, I don't want to really change the subject, but have you noticed that as well? Well, uh, I have noticed that a lot of uh, wealthy businessmen, and I, I, I have, have said, what's our rate of return on this? And for campaigns, the rate of return is abysmally bad. You know, $100 billion put into Jeb Bush campaigns right. has essentially been flushed. Right. You know, uh, and, and the list goes on from Ted Cruz, Mark Rubio. It goes on. A lot of money was spent without a rate of return. And I think that um, wealthy people are pulling back from the campaign or using greater caution. Sheldon Adelson has just come in and said he's going to put $100 million into Trump. And, uh, you know, which is disgusting, but it is what it is. But it's the money we don't see that's going into issues. Uh, and there was a calculation of the rate of return on issues, lobbyists. And Egberto, I'm going to make up a number, okay? And forgive me. I won't make up a number, but I'll give you a, 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 an outlander statement, which is, which is correct. The rate of return on lobbying is in the thousands and thousands of percents. You know, so if, if a, a company like Monsanto, as an example, puts a, a million dollars into lobbying, they can get legislation or protections which returns billions to them. And, and, and it's totally disproportionate. But in an election, as long as we have what we believe to be a free media, as long as we have Egberto Willis out there, as long as, as people are supporting independent media, well, we can say, hey, um, uh, Jeb Bush got $100 million, and I think people are repulsed by that. And there's kind of like an anti-money backlash occurring. So that, that's how I would take a look at money. I, I, is it losing its, its oomph? Maybe at the national political right. surface, but I think it's still going to carry uh, forth from Senate on down. Look, Tim, first of all, Tim said if you listen to Egberto Willis, I also want to say if you listen to Tim Danahy. But uh, let me tell you, Tim, first off, um, I, I, want, I think you corrected me correct. I, you were appropriate in that, that necessary correction for one reason. I really should have stated in the national presidential race because you are so right that that money behind the scenes in lobbying, that rate of return, the way you express that. So folks, Tim is absolutely right in, 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 in that sentiment. 
money will always be a problem in politics. I correct what I said before. It's always going to be a problem in this presidential uh, race because of how the media runs and because this is in front of your faces, it is a little less uh, than, than before. Uh, Egberto, I, I thought the successful rule of, of um, uh, show hosting was like Rush Limbaugh and Bill O'Reilly and Sean Hannity. They're never wrong. I mean, I, 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 thought, I thought a host should never say they're wrong or a host should never learn from their guests. Are you kidding me? Let me tell you something. <laughs> For all the listeners out there, I have learned so much from my guests. I have learned so much from my listeners. If we stop learn, and that is what's affecting our body politic, to, politic as well, that same corollary that you just mentioned there. If you are not someone that is constantly learning, you are, uh, you're intellectually dead. Mm -hmm. If you are not constantly learning, you're intellectually dead. So, no, Tim, I'm, like I said, that is, that is how I think if more hosts were that way, there's so much more we would learn from the public and there's so much more we could get spread around to the public. But Tim, uh, we have another subject that I want to discuss. I think um, the healthcare people know where, uh, where the country stands. I think that was a great discussion. And it's going to be a discussion that's going to be ongoing as well, because we need to get this in front of the faces of, in the, in the air, in front of the faces of many people to really affect that change that you spoke about. And listening to those four things that you gave uh, our listeners as the things they must do to actually affect change, I think it also applies to uh, a lot of what we're going to talk about in the next subject. Um, I want to play uh, two, two pieces here from Crystal Ball. Take a listen to it and then tell me what you guys believe. And then I want to bring Crystal Ball's comments into the fold. Uh, uh, this is sort of a blind side to Tim because Tim, I didn't earlier on tell him to take a listen to Crystal Ball. So what I'll do when we get back from the break is give Tim a little synopsis of what Crystal Ball had to say. Stay with us, listen to the piece, and then we'll be right back to you. I deeply respect Hillary Clinton. I think she's a great intellect with great fortitude. I do not think that she is the right person for this moment. Back in 2008, when all my peers were jumping on the Obama bandwagon, I backed Hillary. The country was reeling from a disastrous eight years of President George W. Bush. We were desperate for competence after his incompetence, for respect for government after his disdain. We needed, in my view, a capable hand. Hillary Clinton was a fantastic fit. But that moment has passed. We are now in a moment of existential crisis as a country. We are recovering slowly from the Great Recession, but as we pick our heads up and look around at where we're heading, we don't like what we see. Only 28% say the country's headed in the right direction. 67% are dissatisfied with the wealth distribution in this country. And as corporate profits soar to new heights, working folks get the shaft, sharing in virtually none of the gains of this recovery. It's clear now that we have two economies, one for a thin slice of educated elite and one for everyone else. That is this moment. So I ask you, does Hillary Clinton sound to you like the right person for this moment? In a time when corporations have hijacked our politics, enabling them to reap all the profit without feeling any compunction to do right by their workers. Is someone who sat on the rabidly anti-union board of Walmart for six years, the right person to restore workers' rights. In a time when we're still reeling from a global financial disaster brought on by foolhardy bank deregulation, is someone who recently took $400,000 to give two speeches at Goldman Sachs the person we need to wrest control of the asylum back from the banking inmates? Someone who at those paid speeches reassured the masters of the universe in attendance that they were being unfairly persecuted. That in her words, the banker bashing was unproductive and indeed foolish. 
Someone whose husband, by the way, did much of the deregulating that got us into trouble in the first place. We need someone who is mission driven, who's clearly passionate, living and breathing and feeling in their bones the plight of the worker. This week's election destroyed more than the Democratic majority in the Senate. It also shattered a number of myths, myths that have enabled Democratic elite complacency. But the last myth, and the one that will doom Democrats in 2016, needs to be busted right here. That myth has to do with the inevitability and electability of a Hillary Clinton presidency. We had a number of proxies for the Hillary Clinton election. Their names were Alison Lundergan Grimes, Mark Pryor, Michelle Nunn, among others. They were what Senator Mark Warner would call radical centrists. You might also call them Clinton Democrats, and I don't think I have to remind you how they all fared. None of these Clinton Dems ran significantly better than the dreaded Obama in their states, despite their rants against the EPA, standing shoulder to shoulder with the NRA and conveniently forgetting who they voted for in the last election. Just consider Senator Mark Warner of Virginia, whose near miss may have been the shock of the night. He'd focused on winning over unwinnable moderate Republicans in red areas of the state rather than trying to excite the base and drive up a big margin in the D.C. suburbs. In his first election to the Senate, Warner won all but six of the 133 counties in the state. This time, his radical centrism made the race so close that his opponent didn't concede until Friday. Voters sent a clear and unmistakable message this election, and it was not that they are in love with the Republicans or with their positions. The message was that they are sick and tired of the way that things have been going, and they want something different. So voters are screaming change from politics as usual, and we in the media are talking about a Jeb Bush, Hillary Clinton election? Voters desperately want something different. They're not looking for carefully calibrated, focus-tested messages. And if that's what they get as they did this year, they may just stay home. Only 36.4% of eligible voters even bothered to show up this election. That's the lowest level in 72 years. Voters don't show up just because there's a Democrat on the ballot. You have to actually give them something to vote for. Hillary Clinton is meeting right now with David Pluff, trying to, quote, define a rationale for her candidacy. We would be wise not to comfort ourselves with the lazy idea that she is inevitable. Because if we hand over all the levers of power to Republicans, well, the last two years will be the good old days. Okay, I, I'm glad that you listened to the few snippets I just played uh, from Crystal Ball. Crystal Ball was, or, was an MN, MSNBC host. Uh, she was one of the co-hosts of the cycle. Um, I met Crystal Ball a few years ago in uh, Netroots. I sat down, we, we spoke a few times. Uh, I also met her last year at Netroots, uh, sitting down in a, um, in a conference, and I got this text that said, Hey, Egberto, didn't realize you were here. And so it came from Crystal Ball, looked back, and there she was, Waving's like, hey, how you doing? But I mean, a great, she's a young woman who I believe it was in Virginia. She ran for Congress, got into some issues with some nasty politics, but in a district that she had no reason to win, she actually came close to winning. She's, like I said before, she's young and many people take her youth or take her for granted because of her youth. And of course, you know, there's a hefty deal of sexism in our politics as well. But I've always considered her one of a, a, a deep thinker in the way politics work, not only because she was a, a, a good host on MSNBC, but because she was in the fire herself as a candidate running. So she can speak from both angles in, in the discussion. But anyhow, uh, for those who are just tuning in now and didn't get a, a chance to listen to the piece, Crystal Ball uh, had something quite intriguing to say. Uh, she said that she did not believe Hillary Clinton should have run. Of, of course, this, she made these comments earlier on in the campaign. She didn't think Hillary Clinton was to run. And I can almost bet that before I specifically tell uh, Tim all the reasons why, that he can come up with some reasons why he think that run was problematic and is likely going to be problematic to actually have her elected in 2016. Tim? 
Well, you know, she, she conveys a lot of experience, and, and I respect that experience. I, I had a gentleman on the show on my show once that said that she's probably the most experienced and qualified person to ever run for president in yes, the United States. However, that does not equate to uh, leadership. It does not equate to vision, you know, as essential components that, that any uh, president must have. He, the president must have the ability to inspire people and to make people believe what they say, that can rally people, that can use this bully pulpit to achieve a result that's good for the nation. I believe she's lost that. You know, uh, Crystal Ball bring, brings this up very, very clearly. And, and I, I once read in The Economist a number of years ago, and they quoted somebody who said, Hillary Clinton will always fight for what is popular and stand courageously against that which is unpopular. You know, that's not leadership. Right. You have to say, I have this vision and this is how we're going to do it. And so now when other candidates, and I'll say Sanders and Trump, sort of, Sanders definitely has a vision. Trump has an anti-trade vision, but Hillary doesn't say what this vision is. And it has been chastised in uh, political cartoons as being, no, we can't, <laughs> you, know, you know, and, and yes, we can, you know, but, but a leader has to take us to there. Martin Luther King wanted to take us to the promised land, you know, uh, uh, Barack Obama, who she's trying to glom off of his, his growing legacy, you know, said, yes, we can, or, 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 or told us, empowered us. Bernie Sanders is trying that. But Hillary Clinton is, is, is like rope-a-dope, you know, Muhammad Ali up against events, fending off blows and not going on the attack or the offensive for the American people. Absolutely. So now the thing about it, Tim, is um, uh, we are, for those, progressives are between a rock and a hard place, right? Because from the numbers point of view, uh, those who believe, those who no longer believe in incrementalism, those who believe we must have uh, uh, pay it forward. I, I, I think before I go go into that, I think one of the big problems with progressives, with liberals, I prefer the word liberal. I am a proud liberal. Uh, one of the things with liberals is that their messaging is horrendous, right? As an example, free education uh, or free college education or free tuition for all doesn't sound very well for the individualistic form that we have as a country. I believe we need to get away from that individualistic form and be more uh, social. I think it makes for happier people. But one of the interesting thing is I think uh, Bernie Sanders should have called it uh, pay it forward tuition in, as opposed to free tuition. I think he should have used, uh, in, instead of just single payer, always use Medicare for all paid forward or something like that. The reasons why is before you get a chance to neuter those that are going to attempt to make it seem like those people who want these, these particular types of programs are on the dole. We don't, I mean, nobody wants, even a, a liberal doesn't want to see a whole lot of people on the dole that don't, that don't need to be on the dole. But that said, Hillary Clinton uh, right now uh, is a problem for more reasons than one, in my opinion. And I, I, I interviewed uh, Angie Morelli on my show, on my Politics and Right show last week. And she's one of the delegates in Nevada. And uh, she was there when the ruckus occurred, uh, where the, the, the wild session where people were screaming in the room and that sort of thing at the Democratic caucus in, in Nevada. And what occurred is Debbie Wasserman Schultz came out without having all the information and simply said, Bernie Sanders folks were violent and he should condemn the speech. I'm gonna play uh, that section of our interview uh, where I asked her some specific questions. I asked Angie, was there any blood? I asked Angie if there was anybody coming out there with any problems, fists, uh, swollen faces or anything. And uh, Snopes already refuted the fact that there were no chairs thrown as was reported by these other people. 
The problem is that Hitler. And you might yeah. also mention, uh, Egberto, that the uh, the chairwoman of the Nevada Democratic Party uh, has no proof that she and her family have been threatened. Exactly. Exactly. So you you put all these items together. It almost seemed like collusion between the establishment Democratic Party as well as the mainstream corporatized media. Did anybody leave that building with blood on their heads, their hands, or anywhere else? No, and you know what? Yeah, wait, let me finish. I, I, I know what you're going to say, ahead. but I, I, want, I, want, I want to ask it this way first, and then I'm, I'm going to ask you to elaborate. Did anybody there leave with a punch in their face? No. Did anybody there leave with a swollen hand, swollen anything? No. Okay, what, how do you define violence? That's a question that I keep on asking everyone, too. I mean, I would, I would define violence as somebody, uh, you know, uh, forcibly putting their hands on somebody else to uh, That's what I thought. cause them harm. I, yeah. that, I honestly thought that was the definition of violence. And l- let me ask you something, and I'm not going to ask you to say this, but I am going to say this. And let me tell you why. As somebody who studied the mechanics of politics for decades, one of the things that I understand is how how narratives get created. In other words... Uh, all along, everything has been peaceful with Bernie's, uh, with Bernie Sanders rallies and all these other issues. But when you're at the end of a convention and you want to create a narrative, you have to look for anything where you can get somehow the the semblance of something wrong occurring. And this was yeah. the best that they could get. And that's why yeah. I think they turned on the motion vote from the establishment corporate media, both from the narrative writers, both from the way. I don't know if you saw the interview between uh, Nina Turner and, and Tamron Hall. I, I, I love Tamron Hall, but I was completely disappointed in the way that she addressed uh, Nina Turner. Uh, it's not that you, you shouldn't be strong in your in your comments, but it was quite evident that she was working on inform- on on bad information, and also there wasn't anybody uh, in Nina's Nina's voice who was Nina was there for eight hours, and your voice you were there for fifteen hours weren't there to refute it. And for those who are preaching unity between the Democrat the different factions within the Democratic Party, it's hard to establish that type of unity when you can actually see the mainstream media and the establishment Democratic Party colluding to, to actually take the rights. I mean, it's not about winning or losing at this point. It is about respect and it's about whether you are valued. And I think what's occurring right now is that those new people that Bernie is bringing into the party, yes, Hillary is up by two million votes. Of course, there are some reasons that we can explain why those million votes are those million votes, but that those are the hard numbers. But what he's bringing in the excitement and absent that, I don't know where we go from there. And you say. Well, I mean, what we have is a situation where they're trying to seize the narrative. Right. And and, and by 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 issuing a shock, a shocking thing. This was illustrated in, in a humorous way in Will Ferrell's movie, uh, The Candidates or whatever that was. It came right. out a few years ago and the, the public was booing him. And, and he said, you know, in response, well, if you're booing me, then you don't support our troops. You know, something totally exactly. ridiculous right. to try and, and, and connect to totally disparate items. Well, this is what's going on in Nevada, too, by saying, well, you're inciting violence, by Barbara Boxer standing up there saying, well, if you're booing me, you're booing Bernie Sanders. Exactly. It's ridiculous in, in, its, in its own sense. And so they've lost control of the narrative. They've lost control of the vision. And so now they have to use, and it's an overused word, uh, rigged, it's chicanery, however you want to use it, where um, popular vote is being overruled by party politics and that is not a healthy situation for america absolutely not and one one hopes that one hopes that we can get around it unfortunately i don't know what can be done now i, I want to get back to crystal ball crystal ball re, uh, wrote a piece that i hope uh sometime, if you get a chance at, at huffington post she posted it two days ago i blogged about it on at the coffee party yesterday and i think I, I I don't remember, but I think I have it at Op-Ed News as well. Egberto, I think I, I saw it on your uh, uh, politicsdoneright.com, uh, or I saw it uh, coming through uh, your page. So yeah, I, I'm I'm somewhat familiar with it. Yeah, it, it is it is an it is a very important read because she itemized some of the reasons why she's telling those supporters of Bernie 
to stay in the fight because we don't know right now uh this morning it, it, some new poll numbers came out and hillary clinton is not doing well against trump and the interesting thing about it is trump has not really started running the type of ads that um that's going to be run against her let me say something tim because a lot of people want to tell bernie sanders one of the reasons you should get out of this race now is because you are the, the words that you're using on Hillary Clinton is going to hurt Hillary Clinton. The fact is, if Hillary Clinton is going to be hurt from those words, we need to inoculate Americans against those words now. She needs to be confronted with those words. But I tell you something, the dossier that, uh, that uh, Trump is going to have for Hillary Clinton it's going to far exceed anything Bernie Sanders has said thus far. And if what Bernie Sanders is affecting her poll numbers now, in a, in a, in a, in, in, in a political environment where Donald Trump can do no wrong, and when I say Donald Trump can do no wrong, Donald Trump has said things, has done things that would have made somebody completely unelectable, and when you find that 30% of black folks would vote for uh, for Trump, when you find that 50 per, oh, way over 50% of white males will vote for Trump, when you find that a, 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 a small but a substantial proportion of Latinos will vote for Trump, we have a problem. And uh, that problem, if it's excess, if it if it's compounded enough by the time of the convention something may have to be done there. And a viable uh, Bernie Sanders at that point, if he keeps his viability, would be something that could be in contention. Your thoughts? Um, I don't know if he can, he will be in contention, but I think at this stage of the game, what we're trying to do, or he's trying to do, is, is influence the platform. Right. The smartest thing that Hillary Clinton could do at this point would be to embrace right. Bernie Sanders and say, hey, he, Bernie Sanders is right about the trade agreement. And then she needs to distance herself from her husband and say NAFTA was a, did not turn right. out to be the great um, uh, trade savior for the United States. The, the audit is in, and, and, and they say it was neutral. That's a separate discussion. She could say, yeah, we do need reform of the health care system. And uh, she, can, she can say, yeah, we do need to reimpose Glass-Steagall. She has to disavow her husband's legacy right. if she can. And if she does that and say, now that we have these, this platform, this program inspired by Bernie Sanders, I'm the one with the experience. And she can go ahead and use the word connections at this point yes. to implement these changes. And at that point, she's on issue. And Donald Trump has to prove his competency on the issues. If she's going to just sit here and, and think that it's going to just be ugly versus ugly... Right. She's going to lose because she has a record. Donald Trump does not have a record. You can't, I mean, he's got a personality, he's got promises. And if she's going to bring her husband in for some, as some sort of economic guru, well, I'm sorry, count me out. You know, uh, there's got to be a better way for me. So I look at that and, and she's, she's making establishment political mistakes. The rules are new now. You know, it's not Walter Cronkite and David Brinkley talking about staid politics from 50 years ago. It's Egberto and Tim were on the Internet and there's billions of people out there and, and the narrative has changed. She has to change with it. And that's the way I would do it. Get back to the issues and the vision as described by Bernie Sanders. Give him credit. Disavow her husband. Husband's policy, say, not disavow, but say we've learned from it. Why make the same mistake twice? And let's see where we can go from there. And then we have to hold her to it. And Tim, you've had the last word on that subject. I think you're absolutely right. Some of us are still wishfully thinking that we could have a true progressive somehow. But that is the pragmatic and most likely outcome maybe she will listen to your wisdom. 
It's been a pleasure having Tim Danahy of the Tim Danahy Show. Danahy.com, Tim Danahy Show for Facebook. And uh, Egberto, it, it's always a delight to uh, talk with you. You're, you're a great man. Thank you very much, Tim. Thank you very much for listening to Politics Done Right. I am your host, Egberto Williams. You can personally reach me by sending an email to Egberto at politicsdoneright.com. Remember, Egberto is spelled E-G-B-E-R-T-O. Change starts with you. 90.1 KPFT gives you information not tainted by corporate interest. Please visit kpft.org and contribute. Let's ensure continued access to real information and news remain available to 